by drawing the poems out the long shadows cast by the 1609 arrangement and shedding new light on their composition, the themes that run through them and Shakespeare's own preoccupations. It's a revelation, it really is. You only need to see the extraordinary reviews from lifelong Shakespeareans to know that it is a gem of a book. Um, and here to tell us more, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Edmondson and Sir Stanley Wells. Paul is Head of Research and Knowledge at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and Stanley is the Honorary President. They collaborated on many books. Uh, Sonnets is the third collaboration for Cambridge, which follows on from the Shakespeare Circle and Shakespeare Beyond Doubt. They have many other books, not just with Cambridge, but we have a, a small selection of, of those that they've written for us. Also, for you to purchase tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I won't overdo the whole thing. Um, but on a personal note, this book was our best selling book last year, and frankly, it threw us a lifeline through those dark days of the COVID lockdown. And I would personally like to thank. Paul and Stanley for everything they've done to make that happen, all their support. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, really. Um, and it's lovely to see then that it's getting a new lease of life as an audio book. Um, so it will be available towards the end of the month uh, with readings from Kenneth Branagh and Lalita Chakrabarty. Um, Sadly, it doesn't look like they'll be making a personal appearance tonight, uh, but we will enjoy a sneak preview of the audiobook as we go along. Um, Paul and Stanley expect to talk for around 50 minutes, and then hopefully there'll be time for questions, and then anyone who wants to buy a book, Paul and Stanley have kindly agreed to sign those copies for you. And of course, we can all enjoy a drink and just a chat afterwards. So, um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Edmondson and Sir Stanley Wells. Thank you very much, sir, and thank you for all that you've done to help us with, with publicising this book. And thanks also to all your staff. It's been really wonderful. We, we, we're very grateful for all the initiatives um, that you put into, into this. Into this event. And the CUP bookshop have been a beacon of light during lockdown yourselves. So thank you. The book plates that were designed just super. So that that's all been fantastic. The great window. The great window. <laughs> so um, that was lovely. And um, and CUP Emily Emily Hoppy, our editor is here. We pay tribute to her. So thank you for everything you've done to make this book possible and its design. And it's, it's beautiful cover, it's end papers, it's gold ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. <laughs> Alistair mentioned that it's just been turned into an audio book. And tonight really is, is a world premiere. We will be able to hear for the first time recordings by Sir Kenneth Branagh and Lisa Chakrabarty speaking these sonnets. Ken Branner, Kenneth Branagh has made a recording of all 154 of the 1609 sonnets. Posterity, I'm sure, will thank him because he speaks them superlatively well, as you'd expect. And Lolita has spoken the female voiced sonnets from the plays, which are in the book, we'll say more about those later on, and, and the whole of the 12,000 word introduction. So between them, it's differently proportioned, but they're about half, half each for the, for the audio book. And we thought we'd go straight into hearing Kenneth Branagh read what was voted last week the UK's favourite poem, Sonnet 18. Sonnet 18. <laughs> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, 
nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Why do you think that's such a popular poem, Stanley? Well, I, I, it has to compete with lots of other great poems, doesn't it? If you think it's, you call it the fav word, the, the Britain's favourite poem, and what does that mean? It's competing with, well, Wordsworth's daffodils, for example, or with Keats's own to a nightingale, uh, or, or with Milton's uh, Paradise Lost, even in thinking of longer poems. I think it, it's a bit of a journalistic gimmick, actually, isn't it, to say it's, it's the nation's famous poem. But still, it is a very great poem. And it is so, for a, reason, a number of reasons, it's lyrical. It's not difficult, not difficult to understand, which is a know how to help. Uh, uh, it, 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 it is a romantic poem, so it appeals to the romantic in, in, in readers and in listeners. Uh, it's a beautifully shaped poem. Uh, the, the, you can you can you can analyze it in, in, in that way, and it it, uh, it 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 has shape. It has a, a conclusion. What how, how do you feel about? Well, it? I'd also add to that and say that it's it reminds us how poetry can help us cope with life. Yeah. So poetry and coping with mortality is the great theme of that poem, yes. and it's a theme of quite a few of Shakespeare's sonnets. And certainly during lockdown, I know people turn to Shakespeare's sonnets all over the world. Yeah, that was Because they're little the units world. of meaning. They take about a minute to read, as we just heard a minute of Ken reading Sonnet 18. And, and, and people find that a very strengthening thing to do. Patrick Stewart read them all on, on, on YouTube, didn't he? Before, yeah. Before, for example, at the, starting with the beginning of, of lockdown. But when did Shakespeare write that sonnet? And to whom is it addressed? This is, these are the sorts of questions our book is interested in. And in order to answer that, we, um, we decided about four years ago, during a class at the Shakespeare Institute, University of Birmingham, we were talking about the sonnets and Stanley was talking about Shakespeare's personality in relation to the sonnets. And I was talking about writing sonnets. And I looked up from our notes and I spoke to the students in the room and said, Stanley, what about arranging the sonnets in chronological order and slotting where we can the sonnets from the plays among the 154 published in 1609? Because no one's ever done that before. Yeah, no one has done it before. It, it, there are all, all the many hundreds of sonnets in English and in other languages too, of course. All of them have either made a selection or have followed the order in which they were printed originally in 1609, uh, and it, it's an order which we feel has, in, in many ways, uh, misled people about the, the meaning and the purpose of the song. So, for example, one of the things that has been said for 250 years about those 1609 sonnets is that the first 126 are addressed to a young man, and the rest are addressed to a, a so-called dark lady. Nothing could be further from the truth. The sonnet we've just heard it doesn't make it clear whether it's addressed to a male or a female. And if you, if you take that sonnet out of the, it comes at the end of the first 17 sonnets, which are addressed to a man and are about procreation, persuading a, a young man to procreate the first 17 sonnets. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the rest of the sonnets following are. And especially when you think about when Shakespeare was writing them, he's not setting out to write a sequence. He's writing, as we've demonstrated in our book, sonnets over, about 30 years. It's a form that means a variety of things to him and differently at different times. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a form that he clearly find, hi, found highly congenial. Uh, it's the only form that he uses among all the forms that were available to him uh, of lyric, lyric forms, except within the plays. Uh, and he, he, writes, he writes them th th right over his career, doesn't he? Uh, from, from his early days, we believe from his school days, uh, right, right to, to for another 30 years. One of the features of our book is that we make it clear at the foot of the page whether the sonnet is addressed to a male or a female subject, or whether it's addressed 
to either a male or a female, as in that one we just heard, could be addressed to either. Um, many of the sonnets are not addressed to anybody. Some of them are personal meditations. Some of them are addressed to abstract concepts. Um, some of them are little essays in miniature. One of them is a religious poem, Psalm 154 Shakespeare's only explicitly a religious poem. So for the purposes of this evening, what we've done is we've selected a few sonnets that we're going to listen to and then talk about. We've deliberately chosen perhaps slightly unusual sonnets, not, I and mean, we've just heard the most famous one, but I think for the rest of the evening you probably won't know them that well. Um, and, and that allows us to illustrate just how differently Shakespeare is using the sonnet form and the purposes to which he's putting it. Yeah, so, of course, uh, it, it's, we, we talked about all this sort of thing in a book that, which we wrote nearly 20 years ago, didn't we? We, we published a book on Shakespeare's sonnets for, uh, for Oxford University Press, the, the rivals, uh, <laughs> in a series of which I'm the general editor of the Oxford Shakespeare. That, that's when we began to break this new ground. It is, yeah. yeah. And in that book, we, we, we uh, also tried to stress that these are, these are, are not a sequence of poems, that they're not addressed to first 126 to a, a man or a boy, that there's no dark lady. Uh, that, this is a myth that comes really from the work of Edmund Malone in the 18th century. Edmund Malone, great Shakespeare officer, uh, made a, a, the declaration about the solids that the first 126 are to a, a male person, the others to a dark lady. And this myth has continued to influence scholars and ordinary readers right up to the present day. I look on, on another book on, on, the, on, the, on the table here. I just had a quick look at what a book on, on sonnets, uh, which has an essay on Shakespeare's on it, and it perpetuates this, this idea. We do, but we do believe that actually producing an edition of the sonnets has been what's needed in order to kind of break this myth. Actually seeing the poems printed with explanation and actually to change the order of them is what it's taken to break the 1609 ordering. There's nothing wrong with the 1609 ordering, but it's not a sequence. It's what people have done with the ordering that's, that's made it so tiresome in its way. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful way of ordering the sonnets. It, it holds within itself mini sequences, little pairs of sonnets, which we'll hear about in, in a moment. Um, but it's what people have done with that and, and how it's perpetuated this myth that we, we really hope we've broken once and for all. So let's hear the next one, please. Sonnet 144. Sonnet 144. Two loves I have of comfort and despair, which like two spirits do suggest me still. The better angel is a man right fair, the worser spirit a woman colored ill. To win me soon to hell my female evil, tempteth my better angel from my side, and would corrupt my saint to be a devil, wooing his purity with her foul pride. And whether that my angel be turned fiend suspect, I may yet not directly tell, but being both from me, both to each friend, I guess one angel in another's hell. Yet this shall I ne'er know, but live in doubt, till my bad angel fire my good one out. It's a personal meditation. Did you spot that? It's not addressed to anybody. It sounds theatrical, or maybe evokes the theatrical like a medieval morality play with a good angel and a bad angel, suggesting things in the speaker's ear, his conscience. What else would you like to say about the poem, Sam? Well, uh, it, 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 if, if we believe that this is a personal poem, as I do, it reveals Shakespeare, for one thing, who is a bisexual Shakespeare, doesn't it? Two loves I have. The better angel is a man right fair. He's idealizing the male beloved. Uh, the worse spirit, a woman colored ill. And this is partly the dark lady, isn't it? Well, yes, it colored ill doesn't mean dark, does it? Not maybe, maybe she has seasickness. <laughs> you know, colored ill, and what does it mean? You know. And of course, what's happened with that sonnet is that's been spotted, and that sense of relationship has been applied across the whole collection. 
Um, but that's not necessarily the case if these sonnets are written over a long time period. You're not setting out to tell a story. You're setting out to write sonnets when you want to write them for different occasions of different people. And some of them probably are to the two subjects mentioned in that one sonnet, but we just don't know this. Certainly the terms of address to male and female in the sonnets which can be identified as being directed to a male or a female are different. They're not always the same forms of address. Different ages are suggested, different social registers, different degrees of intimacy in the, uh, in the, in the, in the diction of the poem. And um, it's a love triangle. Stanley said, you know, we firmly believe after working on this book, Shakespeare was a bisexual person. That was his, that says it's, and I think personally his bisexuality was part of his genius. And I think that whole, that whole tradition, and Virginia Woolf said it, and Coleridge said it, that Shakespeare had a, a man-womanly mind, and that that's what gave him the insights into human nature. I think it's part of his genius. And, and, and this, is, this seems to be very obvious when you look at, at the sonnets, as it were, through a fresh perspective. And so there are two other love triangles in Shakespeare's sonnets. Sonnets 40 to 42 are a love triangle. And sonnets 133 and 134 are another love triangle, not necessarily with the same people. This one relates to Shakespeare's dramatic work, doesn't it? it it's, like, it's a bit like a morality play. It is, yeah. The, 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 the female evil uh, relating to hell on the one side uh, and, and the, the, the meta angel, the angel, the, the supernatural head. It's a bit like uh, 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 like covers, it, it is Merchant of Venice, Venice but also, Stan, you were noticing the obscenity of this poem. Yes, yes. Indeed. So let's hear about the ob obscenities. Well, I guess one angel in another's hell. I mean, hell there is the vagina, isn't it? It's it's it, it's the, uh, the the female sexual organ. Uh, I guess well, the, the angel, I suppose, in a way, then becomes the male uh, organ. Uh, and the firing the good one out. The fire, it, that's a reference to venereal disease. That this has been recognised long before now. Firing it out, uh, the, the, the venereal disease, is suggesting that the woman is uh, is is diseased. So, so you know, when we think about Shakespeare's sonnets, and we've just said a moment ago, they contain some of the best poems ever written in English, e.g., Sonnet 18, and a handful of others. On the whole, these are not poems for Valentine's Day. Mm. <laughs> you know, and one sees, one sees outbreaks in shop windows all over the land around Valentine's Day selling editions of Shakespeare's sonnets. I think, do you really know what you're talking about? <laughs> um, and, and also, it's a confessional poem, surely. I can read it as a confession. And, and one of the things that we think more and more qualifies some of these poems to be regarded as personal poems by Shakespeare, writing about his own inner life, and his own inner struggles, not just, oh, he's a playwright, he writes characters, he's, he's being rhetorical. No, these are not these sorts of sonnets. Many of them have seemed to speak, speak to us as very private poems. It's because they're so frank about sex. And no other sonnet of the period is writing about sexuality in the way that Shakespeare does in some of his sonnets. No, no it's a very reverse of the, uh, the sort of sonnets that were published during the 1590 between 1591 and 1597, 17 sonnet sequences were published. All very artificial poems, most of them uh, by people like, starting off with Sir Philip Sidney and going through with, with Daniel and Drayton and, and, and other poets. All but, all but one of them addressed to, to females, all shorter than the Shakespeare collection. I insist on calling it a collection. I would refuse to call it a sequence. Those are sequences. Those those seventeen sequences written at the same period as Shakespeare is writing, uh, but but they're, they're very different. One of them, however, one there is one sequence of that of that period by Richard Barnfield, which is does include poems addressed to a male person. They're very they're very rather charmingly light hearted homosexual poems. That that's quite clear. And codified through classical names. Yes, yeah, and, yeah. and classical allusions. It's a different kind of project to Shakespeare's. As it were, Barnfield is writing publicly um, about uh, a, a, class of, a, class of, a classical uh, sexuality. Yeah, he, he, he uses Virgil as an excuse, yeah. in fact. He, he, he was yeah. criticised for it. Yeah, he was called out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are, incidentally, two, two versions of this particular sonnet. 
uh, one of which was published in 1599. Most of the sonnets that weren't published until long after they were written, we believe, in 1609, though we believe they were mostly written which mostly between about 1591 to 5, I suppose, don't we? Uh, but uh, in 1599, a publisher called William Jaggard, who's famous partly because he's the publisher of the first folio, a published a tiny little volume of poems, only 19 poems called The Passionate Pilgrim. And it includes three extracts from Love's Labour's Loss. So here we touch on the fact that Shakespeare writes songs in plays, as well as the sonnets of the 1609 collection. And it includes uh, that's um, the version of the one we just heard. And because the version of the one and the heard. version of Sonnet 138. Yes, yeah. Um, when uh, my love swears that she's made of truth, I do believe her. They're slightly different, slightly different. Uh, we say yes, that she's himself revised. revised the revised only versions of those two sonnets are in our book as well. Yeah. Um, let's hear one that we've chosen deliberately because of its difficulty. A lot of the sonnets are quite difficult to understand. Then we're going to hear sonnets up uh, to 136. <coughs> it's it's the second of a pair of sonnets. There are 19 pairs across the collection. The chronological order is not separated and they stay coupled um, and they're all identified in our, in our edition. They've not properly been noticed before by previous editions. And that suggests that on 19 occasions, Shakespeare wrote a poem and then wrote a sequel to it, which I think is a really exciting thing to know. When you hear Ken read them, he speaks them as a pair which we were keen to do on the audio recording. So he'll say, for example, sonnets 135 and 136, and then you'll hear 135, and he'll go straight into 136, as so it's answering 135. So we're going to listen to 136 just now. And um, they're all punning. Th th these two sonnets pun especially on Shakespeare's first name, Will, which in the period was, uh, had, had multiple meanings to do with sex. It referred to both male and female sexual organs. It referred to passion. It referred to sex drive more generally. Um, and his name was William, so he therefore can claim the right to, to pun sexually on his own name, which he does on seven across seven sonnets in the collection. The pun, we find puns on Shakespeare's name. But listen out to the very last few words of this particular sonnet. Sonnet 136. <laughs> If thy soul check thee that I come so near, swear to thy blind soul that I was thy will, and will thy soul knows is admitted there. Thus far for love my love suit sweet fulfill. Will, will fulfill the treasure of thy love. I fill it full with wills and my will one. In things of great receipt, with ease we prove among a number, one is reckoned none. Then in the number let me pass untold, though in thy store's account I one must be. For nothing hold me, so it please thee hold that nothing me, a something sweet to thee. Make but my name thy love, and love that still, and then thou lovest me. For my name is Will. It's a self consciously clever poem, isn't it? I think the wordplay reminds us of the Shakespeare of Love's Labour's Lost, for example, the earlier plays, which are so full of wordplay, of funny, of, of deliberate verbal ingenuity. I want to, to, pay, to pay special tribute to the way Ken Brown reads the sonnets, because when we put it to him that he might like to do this, he immediately responded as if he always wanted to make a recording of Shakespeare's sonnets, never got around to it. And I can think of no other actor of our age who has such an affinity to Shakespeare the man as Ken Brunner. And we were, we were three sonnets into listening to his recording when we realised that what he was doing was he was speaking them as utterances by, as, as, as though spoken by Shakespeare. And that's what you just heard. And that's truly exciting in the way that he's bringing that sense of Shakespeare's imagined personality and drawing it from the words that he's finding on the page. Yeah, you may have seen uh, the film uh, that he made about Shakespeare, All, All is True. Uh, and one of the best scenes in that, it seemed to me, was a scene in which Branagh and Ian McKellen both read the same sonnet, one of the most popular of the sonnets, sonnet number 29. 
um, which shows the infinity of what these. And they both speak with different inflections, they do kind of different meanings at that point in the film. Um, that one was addressed to a woman. Did you spot that? Which is important to notice. Um, and here is a paraphrase of that sonnet, because the, the, the book includes paraphrases of all of the uh, 182 sonnets in, in, in the book, not 154 in this edition, 182 sonnets, paraphrases of all of them. When we were working on the edition, we would compare our edition of the actual printed poem with the notes and pass these over to each other and think about them and, and, and talk about them. And one day, Stanley turned to me and said, Paul, these are such difficult poems. And I said, if you and I think that, what about our readers? What are we going to do? And again, tribute to Cambridge University Press, because you did not know this was part of the original proposal, and it wasn't. But we said, can we include paraphrases of all of these poems? And you said, yes, we could. Can we read a paraphrase? Yeah, here's, here's 136, the one you just heard, in case you didn't follow, it's quite difficult. This is, this is one version of what it means. The paraphrases are deliberately literal. They're not trying to be elegant. They want, we wanted to, as it were, allow the oddities of expression within the sonnets to find their way through to modern prose. Sonnet 136. If your conscience resists my advances, know deep down that I was the name of your desire, and desire, your conscience knows, is admissible. Therefore, dear, let me fulfil my love suite. My name and desire will fill up the treasury of your love, fill it with many desires, and with my one overriding sexual desire. For things of great capacity, it is easy to demonstrate that to receive one thing more is neither here nor there. Though I will increase the tally of your lovers by one, count me as nothing so long as you regard that nothing as some thing which is pleasant to you. Even if you loved only my name and loved that continually, then you would love all of me because my name expresses my sexual desire for you, will. And we invite the reader to kick against our paraphrases and write your own, <laughs> improve them, but, but they'll hopefully take you a long way to understanding the meaning of these remarkable poems. We also include, uh, in order to, uh, to help the reader, we include one or two other aids. We include a little short summary of the, of, of the, of the poem. Oh, we'll come to that later on. Okay, yeah. all right. So let's go on to the next one, please. Another very different kind of sonnet. This one is addressed to the poet's soul. Sonnet 146. Poor soul, the center of my sinful earth, rebuke these rebel powers that thee array. Why dost thou pine within and suffer dearth, painting thy outward walls so costly gay? Why so large cost, having so short a lease, dost thou upon thy fading mansion spend? Shall worms, inheritors of this excess, eat up thy charge? Is this thy body's end? Then, soul, live thou upon thy servant's loss, and let that pine to aggravate thy store. By terms divine, in selling hours of dross, within be fed, without be rich no more. So shalt thou feed on death, that feeds on men, and death once dead, there's no more dying then. Why don't we try the thumbnail sketch? At the front of each page of the, of the 609 sonnets, there's a little thumbnail summary of the poem that's printed above. So I know when Gregory Doran was flicking through these, the typescript with, with trying them out with some of the actors, the RSC, he said, we love the thumbnail sketches because you could flick through and say, oh, I think I'll, I think I have one of those. <laughs> and then read the sonnet above it because it gave you a sense of what the, the poem was going to be about. Well, this one is just reads, poor soul, do not waste any more time trying to help my deteriorating body. Look inwardly and eternally and thus kill death. Yeah, it's the, it's the only <clears throat> religious poem by Shakespeare, yeah. with the possible exception. The Phoenix and the Church. The Phoenix and the Church, which is religious. But, uh, the, the, this is, and this is, is a, that very fact illustrates the fact this is not a sequence, doesn't it? That, that, that this group of, this collection of poems 
includes one which is not a love poem at all. It's addressed to the soul. It's an argument. It's beautifully shaped, this the song you just heard. Um, I don't know if you will see it more in, you, in, in printing, but certainly I heard in Ken's reading that the first four lines are a question. And then the next two lines are a question. And then you get two questions on one line. So there's a kind of intensification of, of, of self-examination and, and asking the soul questions as you go through the poem. And then you get that lovely turning by which happens normally around um, line, um, line in, in a sonnet called the Volta. Although sometimes Shakespeare saves it until line 13 when we change direction and we had it there with then yeah, so. so. Um, so you get a beautiful sense of argument, and then the the conclusion in the couplet. The resounding conclusion. So shall thou feed on death that feeds on men, and death wants dead. There's no more dying then. It's wonderful. We use uses the rhythm wonderfully there too. This is a damaged sonnet. Uh, it, 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 there's a misprint in, in, in the first edition, which reads: Poor soul, the centre of my sinful earth. My sinful earth, these rebel powers that they erect. Accidentally, the phrase my sinful earth is repeated in place of whatever Shakespeare wrote in the second line. A lot of conjectures have been made to try to, to, to mend the sonnet. We don't, we don't try, we just put a pair of empty square brackets, uh, let the reader fill in whatever he or she might might you know, For the recording, we had to make a decision though and put in a put in the missing word. So we chose review. Review is the most one of the very common replacements for that hiatus in the poem. Now we wonder if a damaged sonnet in the 1609 quarto um, adds evidence to our continued thought that Shakespeare didn't want them to be published, that it wasn't it wasn't well printed enough. It didn't have his authorization in the sense that Venus and Adonis. And the Rape of Lucrece is to now to poems clearly did because they're beautifully printed. A single mistake in them. Yeah, yeah we, there is some evidence uh, in, in favour of the idea that Shakespeare didn't want them published. For example, when they were first published in 1609, uh, they, they were published with a title page saying Shakespeare's sonnets never before imprinted. Now, if it, it, for the plays, it would normally say, as it were, Hamlet by William Shakespeare. This doesn't say sonnets. By William Shakespeare. It's, it's a third person title, Shakespeare's Songs. And also the dedication in that volume is by the publisher, Thomas Thorpe, not by Shakespeare. Normally, of course, the, the author of a book would dedicate it. But in this case, uh, it's dedicated to a mysterious Mr. W.H. An enormous quantity of writing has been devoted to efforts to try to identify who Mr. W.H. is, and nobody has succeeded. Uh, it, it, with any with any certainty in identifying Mr. or Master, it would have been in Shakespeare's time, WH. Mr. And it, the dedication is signed by Thorpe, not by Shakespeare. So the, it, it's not Shakespeare's own dedication. And this is all part of the evidence for the, the belief that Shakespeare didn't even want the sonnets to be published. It's interesting, that volume was never reprinted. Whereas Shakespeare's great poems, Venus and Adonis and Great Lucrece, much less popular nowadays than the sonnets are, uh, were, were among the most popular books of the whole period. Uh, the, the Venus and Adonis is reprinted like 13 yeah. times in Shakespeare's lifetime, and Rape of Greece comes fairly close. But the sonnets were not popular in their own time, they weren't reprinted until 1640, and then in a garbled version, and then they went out of circulation until Malone. Uh, pick them up in, in the late, late 18th century. century yeah. Let's move on to one of the sonnets in the plays. And yeah. here um, we have Ken Branagh as Romeo and Alita Chakrabarti as Juliet. And we know that they speak a sonnet, don't they? They share, as it were, love at first sight, and then they utter a sonnet together in dialogue. And there it is embedded in Romeo and Juliet at the Capulet Ball. Sonnet 146. In Romeo and Juliet, the lovers speak a sonnet when they fall in love at first sight and start a second one. From Romeo and Juliet, Act One, Scene Five. Okay. 
I profane my unworthiest hand, this holy shrine, the gentler sin is this. My lips to blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Have not saints lips and holy palmers too? I pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. Oh then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray, grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. Then move not while my prayer's effect I take. As from my lips by thine my sin is purged. And have my lips the sin that they have to look. Sin from my lips, O oh, trespass, sweetly urged, give me my sin again. You kiss by the book. And then the nurse interrupts them, but they were just, they just spoke in the quatrain of another sonnet. Um, and this illustrates one of the original features of our book, of course, that we intersperse the, the non-dramatic sonnets of 16 Burton volume with sonnets from plays. Shakespeare was obviously so keen on the sonnet form that he often uses it uh, within the plays for a variety of purposes. And we were just talking about the, the religious sonnet. That sounded to me like a, quite a religious moment in the play. It sounded prayer-like to me, especially the way they spoke it. And it's about pilgrimage, it's about prayers, it's about um, kisses being like prayers, um, either on a, a relic or on someone else's lips. So it seemed, seemed to be a very, very holy moment, that, that first meeting of Romeo and Juliet. Um, it allows us to think about why Shakespeare's writing sonnets within drama, Stanley. Yes, uh, uh, he, of course, the plays are, are use verse measures of different kinds, mostly, of course, blank verse, which has the same uh, line, rhythmic line as, as the sonnet does, the iambic pentameter, which Shakespeare was so, so fond of. Uh, but he, he does find the sonnet form useful sometimes, both for two, I think, for two main purposes. One is for rhetorical purposes, uh, especially in, for example, prologues. The prologue to Romeo and Juliet is a sonnet. The prologue to the second act of Romeo and Juliet is also in sonnet form. Uh, Henry V has, has a sonnet. Uh, as prologue, epilogue. as an epilogue, sorry, in, in that case. Um, so there are, uh, there, there, are the, there are the rhetorical sonnets in the plays, there are also the more intimate ones. Uh, sometimes he is using the sonnet as a way of uh, setting off a particular moment, either individually or between two speakers, as he does in Romeo and Juliet, uh, where, where you get a feeling of intimacy uh, created by the use of the in, of the solid form within the, the overall blank verse structure. That's particularly true in Romeo and Juliet, where with the, solid, the, the passage we heard, where Romeo and, and Juliet are falling in love, uh, and it, it sets it off. I remember a production by Trevor Nunn. Uh, this, 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 this passage takes place in the ball scene, that there's, there's a dance going on, and then suddenly Romeo sees Juliet and they, they click. Uh, and uh, in that production, the, the scene was very animated uh, until the beginning of, the, of this sonnet, but then he put the lights down, the froze the action. You saw uh, the, the dance going on in a shadowy sort of way, and the spotlight, literally the spotlight, was entirely on the lovers as they spoke this. And this is one of the ways that Shakespeare sometimes uses sonnet form within the plays as a way of revealing an intimate moment uh, which is set off from the action around it. He does it with Helen. Helena in, in, in also the Tensworth, for example, he does it here in, in Romeo. He does it with Cressida too, though in that case Cressida is a sequence of forty, uh, a sequence of couplets, not 
what exactly 14 lines. It's, it's as if we're in dramatic slow motion. It's like the language of dramatic slow motion into a character's emotion. That's what it feels like he's doing, spotlighting the inner life of a character through using the sonnet form. And um, another example is, is of Beatrice. Yes, yeah, so we're going to hear that one later on. Yeah, right. And um, what about how we decided which ones in the plays to include? Yes, it was very difficult. I went through the complete works three times trying to find more sonnets. And one of them only, I only got at the very last moment, four points that that was uh, It was very Thank difficult. Thank you, Steve. People allowing us to include the <laughs> proof stage. <Yeah. laughs> it, it, it was difficult, partly. Uh, Partly because, in some cases, it's not a complete sonnet. Uh, for example, in, in much you do about nothing, should I say, to, to talk about something here? Not just yet, okay, no, we're going to say it to the end. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes he uses it as an incomplete sonnet for. Uh, uh, but we had to negotiate carefully. What do, what, what do we mean by a sonnet? So we allowed in what we call foreshortened sonnets, by which we mean two quatrains and a couplet which are deliberately significant in the drama. Orlando running through the forest of Arden, hanging poems on the trees about Rosalind, speaks a foreshortened sonnet. Uh, Beatrice does, as Stanley just mentioned. We find them in Pericles, find them in Cymbeline. What we find, and as Stanley going through the works three times, um, is that they're throughout Shakespeare's career. If we can think about the works chronologically. From the Two Gentlemen of Verona, which has been thought of as an early play, Valentine's letter to Sylvia, intercepted by the Duke, is a foreshortened sonnet. Um, and he, it's a form he cannot leave behind, as late as All is True, Henry VIII, which he collaborates on with John Fletcher. The epilogue of that play is also a sonnet. So let's move on to, um, just mention Valentine's letter. There are two letters in the 1609 collection, and one of them is sonnet 26, which we'll hear just now. Um, and what we like to say, well, we don't like to say, we don't say this now, but Shakespearean biographers often have said, oh, if only we had correspondence that survives by Shakespeare. And in fact, we do, and it's two sonnets. <laughs> so here's, here's, here's one letter by Shakespeare, as it were, um, Sonnet 26. Sonnet 26. Lord of my love, to whom in vassalage thy merit hath my duty strongly knit, to thee I send this written embassage, to witness duty, not to show my wit. Duty so great, which wit so poor as mine, may make seem bare in wanting words to show it, but that I hope some good conceit of thine in thy soul's thought all naked will bestow it, Till whatsoever star that guides my moving points on me graciously with fair aspect and puts apparel on my tattered loving to show me worthy of thy sweet respect. Then may I dare to boast how I do love thee, till then not show my head where thou mayst prove me. I'm just going to read the thumbnail sketch of that sonnet. Lord of my love, I write this out of respect for you rather than to demonstrate my skill, and hope you will look kindly on my bare ability and efforts, then I shall be able to boast about my love for you. It's addressed to a man, obviously, Lord of my love, which shimmers with ambiguity, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. Uh, Lord of my love, it, it, it could be simply used metaphorically, you who are, who are a master of my, of my capacity to love. But it also could be addressed to a member of the aristocracy, of course, Lord of my love. It could be public on that. And I, 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 I do sometimes think this might be a poem addressed to the Earl of Southampton, I must confess. Why do you think that? Because Shakespeare clearly had uh, knew the Earl of Southampton very well. Uh, the true narrative of poems, the Incendus, the Great Lucrece, are both addressed to the Earl of Southampton. Uh, Lucrece is very loving and very affectionate terms. And uh, the, the, we know of other connections between Shakespeare and Southampton. Love's Labour's Lost were performed at Southampton House, for example, in the late 16th century. 
Uh, and also that there are, there are, I mean, it fits in with the first 17 poems, which are addressed to a younger male person, ask him, inviting him to marry or urging him to marry. Southampton was 11 or 13 years younger than Shakespeare. His mother was constantly urging him to get married. He was bisexual, we have evidence for that. Uh, there's a story about him having uh, an affair with an officer during the Irish campaign. So I, I have I've written a little essay about the Earl of Southampton uh, and Shakespeare. Uh, I suspect that, 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 that they were, that, that Southampton was the lord uh, of Shakespeare's life. Um, but that, that, that is speculative, but I think it's not entirely without corroborative evidence. I think, I think what Sam has just really well illustrated is how reading these poems biographically, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But what, what's become the case is that people have actually used a 1609 ordering and made biography of it and allowed it to in, influence the writing of Shakespeare and biography. So in some Shakespeare biographies, the biography even asks the question, well, who was the young man of the sonnets? Who was the dark lady of the sonnets? Whereas what Stan has just done is he's, he's illustrated how intermittently you can still do that, but that doesn't mean say it connects up with all the other sonnets, not all mm -hmm. about Southampton. Did you see that there's a, a huge difference in, in reading biographically in terms of what used to be the case and what is now possible to make the case as, as Stanley just has. Um, the other sonnet, which is a letter, which you might like to know about is Sonnet 77. And it accompanied a notebook, which Adam Barker of the Shakespeare Institute University of Birmingham identified extremely well, just as we were finishing our book, as actually being an almanac. And almanacs had blank pages printed within them on which the reader could make his or her own notes. Um, and clearly the notebook that's being talked about in Sonnet 77, which is a gift to the addressee of the sonnet, is, is an almanac. Yeah, it's interesting. That shows how discoveries continue to be made about Shakespeare's sonnets. Uh, it's only in 1971 that Andrew Go showed that uh, one of the sonnets is a wooing sonnet addressed to Anne Hathaway. It, uh, it's been accepted ever since because it puns on, on the name of Anne Hathaway. You this is this is sonnet 145, and we hear in the couplet, "I hate from hate away she threw." And hate away was an alternative pronunciation of Hathaway, but that wasn't mentioned until 1971 which again is another example of how you can compellingly read an individual sonnet biographically if, if, if it allows you to in particular ways. And it's partly for that reason that we place that sonnet third in our collection. The first two in our collection are the two that are last in, in the 169 volume, which are in fact translations. They're both translations of a Greek uh, ep epigram. The same, the same epigram. The same epigram. Different, different and again, it was only quite comparatively recently that somebody showed that one of those is a revision of the other, so that we print them in the reverse order, not, not, the, not 150, 154, but 154 and 153. We put them at the beginning of the collection, and I conjecture that those might even be schoolboy exercises. Why, at any point in his career, would Shakespeare be wanting to translate a Greek epigram, except when he had to, because the schoolmaster told him to, uh, and, and told him to revise it when it wasn't quite good enough. You can do better than this, William. You can do better than this, William. Really. So we, we put those as number one and number two in our chronological order collection, and then we put the Hathaway, the wooing sonnet, which if it was written, if, as, as uh, suggest, in, uh, it would have been written in, in 1582 when Shakespeare was wooing. And when he was 18. When he was 18 yeah. years old, yes. So uh, that's, that's an aspect of the reordering that we've done in the book. Well, let's finish by listening to Lolita again. Um, she reads the female voiced sonnets from the plays, and as it were, sonnets which could be male or female spoken. So she speaks Jupiter in Cymbeline, uh, for example. So here she is speaking Beatrice. This is Beatrice coming out of hiding when she's been tricked into hearing Margaret and Ursula say how much Benedict is in love with her. 
And this is what she says when she is alone. <laughs> Much ado about nothing, Beatrice's women friends have been trying to trick her into falling in love with Benedict by allowing her to overhear them saying that he is in love with her. As she comes out of concealment, she speaks a foreshortened sonnet. From Much Ado About Nothing, Act 3, Scene 1. What fire is in mine ears? Can this be true? Stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt farewell and maiden pride adieu. No glory lives behind the back of such. And Benedict, love on, I will requite thee, taming my wild heart to thy loving hand. If thou dost love, my kindness shall incite thee to bind our loves up in a holy band. <clears throat> For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it better than reportedly. It's an inward moment, isn't it? Beatrice comes forward uh, after the, uh, the, the it, it's a comic scene that people have been uh, trying to trick her into believing that Benedict loves her, but she believes that she believes the trick. And she comes forward and speaks this social and solid. I've seen actresses try to play it too much for comedy. I remember when Judy Dench played it, however, she played it very inwardly. Uh, 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 as as if as if it was as if Beatrice had undergone a genuine revelation as a result of the trick of Beethoven played upon her, and this helped to justify that the use of the solid form it was set you know, set off very much from the rest of the play. Part of that revelation is it's the first poetry she speaks thus far in the play. She's been speaking prose until this point, and then she suddenly speaks a sonnet. So the, as it were, the spotlight on her inner life couldn't be shone brighter by Shakespeare in giving Beatrice a sonnet at this point. And actually going on into the play, Benedict, and some of you will have seen the marvelous film version with Ken Browner playing Benedict, um, is trying to write a sonnet in praise of Beatrice. I can think of no rhyme for lady except baby, he says. Um, and, and then at the end, it, it, it turns out they've both written sonnets for each other. And we never hear them, but we see them as pieces of paper. We should see them as pieces of paper on the stage because they sort the sonnets and we see them read silently each other's sonnets at the end of a production of Much Ado. And we, we the audience, see their reactions to what they're, we imagine them reading. We actually hear the sonnets themselves. So those are, as it were, sonnets as props um, uh, in, in, in Mono Shakespeare's place too. There's another um, sonnet, another, just to finish off with just to mention it with the third story, because yeah. that's also about trying to write a sonnet. Yeah, it? It, a play which has only recently been admitted into the Shakespeare canon, Edward III, uh, which uh, is included in, in the second edition of the Oxford Complete Works. And Cambridge got there first in the Cambridge Shakespeare <laughs> single volume edition edited by Giorgio Melchiori in 1996. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Um, the the uh, Edward the Third. There's the, in the Shakespeare one of the Shakespearean scenes of that play. Uh, the king uh, is shown trying trying and failing to write a song, and he gets his secretary to help him. Uh, it, it, he's engaged in an adulterous wooing of of the countess in that play. So it's fascinating to see Shakespeare uh, getting uh, portraying somebody trying to, to write a song as he does. And Stanley wrote that, wrote that part of, uh, wrote, wrote about it for the first part of the introduction. Um, and that, that bit you mentioned that the story of wooing the Countess of Salisbury through his secretary is in the source for Edward III, but not in the source. Is the, is the secretary trying to write a sonnet in order to do so. So it's, it's very Shakespeareanized in terms of um, wanting that moment to be about sonnet writing, which is a great, great observation. So, so there we'll, we'll pause. We've heard seven sonnets spoken by Ken yeah, Brown and Louise Chakrabarty, and we're happy to take some questions. Thank you. There's a lot of first of all, one thing I think the representation, um, the confessional aspect of some of them, the sonnet as a structure for the writer, 
it seems to me this is what you're bringing forward. But was there any sense in his writings that he was writing as a persona of himself? Or was this, is your sense it was almost Darwin work or, or trying to get out truth? He was, he was after. So the question for those on Zoom is, um, is there any sense in, do you mean in the sonnets themselves or in the wider work that he's speaking through a persona rather than the speaking directly from it? Like yeah. the sonnets you, you sense it's the voice of the writer, it's almost confessional, it's mm -hmm. almost diary work. He's speaking within himself, trying to work out something. Uh, and then he uses that form to, to show truths with the characters within the plays. Is there any evidence of the counter to that where he's writing as someone else or as a voice? Well, when you say as a voice, I, I hear in that question the, uh, the, the degree of amplification that we as readers, and that applies to it, you know, all readers of sonnets, um, might understand in terms of Shakespeare's own personal voice within each poet. Um, and that's where we, where the, in some ways, where the rubber hits the road in terms of how do you decide how personal a poem is? At what point do you say, well, this, this, is, this is more public? This is, this is less personal somehow. Um, the Lord of My Love sonnet, which we've just heard, seems very declaratory. It seems as though he is adopting the persona of a servant. He uses the, he uses the word vassalage in sonnet 26, um, very much about a servant paying tribute to a, a lord, a master, and adopting that um, position, which is part social register, but I think partly performance on Shakespeare's part, because when you think about what that might mean in terms of um, how Shakespeare writes about love in relation to service elsewhere, that, that's, that's one of the strands of Shakespeare's sonnets, but we also find it in the plays, I'm thinking of Valentine referring to Sylvia as, Sylvia referring to Valentine as her servant. So it's, it's, it's partly about courtly love, isn't it? When, when the male becomes a servant to the, to the female he's trying to woo. So maybe there's a, a, a whiff of that in that, in that sonnet. Um, shall I compare you to a summer's day? I mean, I remember you said earlier today, Stanley, how that, that strikes you as a poem written for publication yeah. in, in a way that the one about, you know, the love triangle ones just, you know, yeah. Why, why would you? Why would you want to um, write those apart from to try and work something out inwardly yeah. uh, that you're you're living out um, in your own life? It's, a, it's your a soliloquy by the of the author rather than by the author. Yeah. yeah. So does that answer your? It gets at it. Yeah. It gets at it, doesn't it? But it's it is it is the eternal question you've asked about the relationship between the artist and the work. Is is the, is the big question over what you just asked, isn't it? Because it, it, there's a sense that if he didn't need to publish them, he's collected them somewhere, yeah. yeah, right? And so if you were to categorize, maybe I'll publish this one, this one's a good one, or this one is confessional, mm -hmm. this one's very close to me working something out, but there's such, there's such tight mechanical constructions that you feel that he has worked out a lot of ideas before he Boil them down to the sonnets. You, you know, another way of answering this question and thinking about it is that the most famous sonnets, that as it were, everyone knows, the most anthologized, about 12 of them, the most obviously likable and therefore publishable have bubbled to the surface over time. And we all know them. Let me not to the marriage of true minds. I've missed impediments, when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes. That time of year thou mayst in me behold. When I do count the clock that tells the time, these feel publishable, these feel public in the way that many of the others, which are quite frankly quite difficult to read, do not. It's so inward. And the more we think about them, the more we, we're not, I hope we're not pressing this too hard. I just think it seems so clear that if we want to find Shakespeare's biography in the sonnets, it is there, and it's there in ways that we've still got to think about in relation to how we read these poems. They are, you know, his soliloquies. Yeah, question at the back. It, uh, it goes along with what you were just saying on here. Um, you talk about prearrangement into your scholarship in this book, trying to break out of this, this myth or this idea that people had all the science before. And so I use this word in the, in the 
positive sense you kind of have an agenda for, for this um, project. Is there a sense that you had to avoid certain pitfalls or there certain things that you guys um, were careful about, not not um, sort of reading the agenda that you wanted and sort of ensuring openness as you were arranging these and writing about these? these Thank you. So that's a very good question. The question for people on Zoom is, um, you know, we, we've set out to um, remove the problems that have occurred because of people just assuming the same thing about 1609 ordering for two and a half centuries. Has, has that got in the way? Has our own agenda got in the way? How did we negotiate that as we were actually working on it? And we did have to negotiate it. We did, and it's, it, 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 we, the, the more you write about Shakespeare's sonnets, the more you realise that you've got to be so careful with the language you use. They, they, they need a lot of careful handling. Um, you know, the whole male female thing, how you work out whether uh, it's addressed to a male or a female, for example. And most of them are not. Most 84 of them could be either to a male or a female, for example. Um, but then mini sequences, when, when do you decide there's a mini sequence in the collection of 1609? And does that, uh, it, how, how do you identify it? Well, sometimes it's got some grammatical links. Yes, isn't it? that's very when true. Then, that's and then you get it with the pairs. That, the yeah, pairs yeah. are undeniable. The pairs are so um, but it's a very good question because it, it, there, was, there are many things to negotiate when you start to, as it were, look at each of these poems as, as it were, individual suspects and think that they're not, you know, let's assume there's no connection. Um, and then what, then what do we learn? What can we say about it? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I first of all, thank you. And I'm sorry to ask this question, but I can't not because I'm sitting here and you're sitting there. Um, I'm not a student of English literature, I'm a student of Italian literature. And I know, well, I understand that Shakespeare had his lost years in Italy. And then he, his sonetti, the idea of writing a sonnet came with inspiration in Italy, which brings us the dark lady. I don't know if this is true, but to what extent do you think this lost time, I find it quite ironic, particularly in the world we live in now, when everybody knows everything about everybody, that we know very little, probably about the one of the most famous people in the world. Um, to what extent do you think his lost years, should they be real in Italy, influence the sonnet? Well, I'm, I'm going to do two things with that question. First of all, I'm going to genuinely tell you that there's no evidence at all that Jake's very went to Italy. Right. Um, but he did go to Italy in the sense that he read about Italy. And it was the Italy of, of, of the literature of his time. It was the Europe of the literature of his time. And absolutely undeniable, the sonnet is an Italian form, originally Petrarch Dante, um, and it comes over to um, England around the middle of the 16th century, and it's therefore a very Italian form, which Shakespeare and his contemporaries are anglicising, and because English is not a rhyming language as, as Italian can be, you know this as a student of Italian literature yourself, you know, the many rhyme possibilities are just not available as they are in, in, in Italian to, to the English person. Um, so they had to anglicise the, the, the form um, and what we now think of as the Shakespearean, there was a Spencerian sonnet, which has a different rhyme scheme, and then the Shakespearean sonnet, which, we, which we've, we've come to understand as he, he makes himself absolute master of the, of, of, of the sonnet form. Um, the, going back to your, the lost years, well, I personally don't believe that anything untoward or dramatic had to happen in the last years. I think it's a biographical uh, need. Yeah. Um, it's a biographical fiction that, that's popped into the understanding of Shakespeare's life over many years. Um, gaps in the lives of early modern people are not unusual. Mm -hmm. So why should it mean something especially significant to Shakespeare's mm -hmm. that we have almost nothing on record for seven years? Um, uh, so I feel quite relaxed about, he could have been in Stratford, he could, he, could, he could have been exploring his father's interests, business interests in London. Oh, he could have been on, he could have been belonged to a, a troop of actors and been- All sorts of things he might have been doing. But, 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 the, but, but the, the, the Italian influence is, is really the important part of, of that sense of Shakespeare in Italy um, and a third of his plays are set in Italy, for example. But that's mainly because of... Well, it's partly because of William Painter's Palace of Pleasure, which is a translation uh, of many short stories from Bandello, uh, for example, uh, was a very popular volume. It, it had a big effect on the whole of English drama. It's partly why so many uh, English plays uh, of the Shakespearean period are set in Italy. Uh, Italy was the land of romance. It was also the land of villainy. It 
was the land of melodrama. Uh, and that's why you get sometimes tragedies set in Italy, uh, Webster and uh, other people, and Fletcher, Fletcher and so on. And why also you get romantic comedies set in Italy. It, it's a, a sort of never never land in, in, in a way. We'd love to take some questions from people on Zoom, please. Yes. Um... Conscious of the time, we've got yes. lots coming in, well, uh, so we can, we can pick out one. We'll try and go quickly through them. Yeah. <laughs> Quick fire, two questions. Um, so, Jen Richardson asks You mentioned that you think the sonnets were never intended for publication by Shakespeare and that they're very personal poems. Which sonnet or sonnets have struck you both as the most private and revealing in their name? Well, Jen, thank you. It's a lovely question. We've heard one of them this evening, at least one of them, which is Sonnet 136. I definitely add the other love triangle ones, 40 to 42, uh, 133 to 134. Um, they are enigmatic in their way and, and difficult. And I think in some ways where he's been most difficult and most contorted, they perhaps are, maybe it's a, maybe it's a kind of personal signal that it's just, it, it's, he's working something out as accurately as possible and as, in as nuanced a way as possible for himself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and actually, you hear that in Ken's readings. You really do it brings them to the fore because you, when we were listening to them, we, we chopped our way through them, didn't listen to them yeah. on several evenings. Ken reading the sonnets, and we kept thinking, oh, that's surely a really personal one. It's so, listen to what he's really saying, you know, what he's confessing, what he's talking about. Um, and this leads nicely into the, the final question. Can you tell us a bit more about um, the process of the audio book recording and how you found that? So the process of the audiobook recording, um, well, it was, it, it, it was, it, 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 the negotiations took place over about two years, didn't they? And, and it was clear that, that Ken wanted to read the 1609 sonnets, so we absolutely pursued that. And then Sound Understanding and Cambridge University Press uh, started to negotiate how an audiobook uh, might be made. And then there was a period when we thought it wasn't going to be possible. And, I, and then it was maybe finding a private funder um, to fund the recording of Ken speaking the 1609 sonnet because that's what posterity longs for, for sure. Um, and, um, and then Sound Understanding in Cambridge after lockdown was like, we can do this. And it was this great sort of beacon of hope. And Lalita Chakrabarti came on board who trained with Ken at RADA. And she happens to be married to Adrian Lester and she's a playwright and an actor. And she wrote the play Red Velvet about Ira Aldridge, which Ken directed or hosted in his season at the Garrick Theatre, which we saw a couple of years ago. So it was all kind of coming together. And then they were recorded in August. And um, Ken was in a studio in Hammersmith. Um, and he did them over a day and a half. That's all, and and he, he came having done all of his homework. He really did his homework because his, his recordings of these sonnets are varied and he's bringing a lot to each individual poem and they're a delight because of that. Um, and we were on the phone waiting for it to ring because the producer who was obviously Ken in, behind the microphone would ask us occasionally, uh, it was mainly, the phone rang nine times, we had it on all day <laughs> and, and, and we were there to answer any questions that Ken had. Um, and they were mainly questions about pronunciation they said, every question of meaning has been answered by your book. <laughs> they said, it's been a great road test of your book because when we've, we've wondered what sonnet might mean or words, the book has answered it. And then Alita went in the next day and recorded the whole of the introduction and the female voice sonnets. And that, that, actually that Romeo and Juliet sonnet will let you into a secret. They recorded it at different occasions and then it was edited together, which you, it's done beautifully, isn't it? Um, we think that was the last question, but there is just one so I'm learning at the end of that and that's the final, final question. Um, just having read the fact that I really love the environment and you've got to be looking for a Well, the cover designer is in the room. Yeah. Oh, we love the lilies. We consider the lilies, how they grow. <laughs> So it, I, I remember seeing it for the first time and Emily said, this is the cover. And I was, I was slightly and beautifully taken aback because it was so fresh as a way to, as a way of illustrating Shakespeare's sonnets. And we, we, we had talked, we remember that evening meeting we had with nice Chris Burroughs from CUP. And we, talk, we talked about um, uh, images of the natural world in some way, didn't we? And, and you captured it and the sense of them growing. And, and yeah, so it's a lovely cover. 
<laughs> well, thank you all for listening and thank you Zoom for attending and uh, we look forward to the film being made available. <laughs>